This summer, see the movie the whole world is talking about. You want to get through this? Run. Mad Max Fury Road. Mad Max Fury Road is a 2015 Australian post-apocalyptic action film that was co-written, co-produced, and directed by Australian filmmaker George Miller. The film serves as both the fourth instalment and a revisiting of the Mad Max film series. Although the film is the highest grossing Mad Max film, it was seen as a box office disappointment, grossing just 375 million US dollars against a production budget of 154.6 to 185.1 million US dollars incurring overall losses of up to 20 to 40 million dollars. However, the film was a critical success upon its release in 2015. The film scored a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes with an average rating of 8.6 out of 10 and an 8.1 out of 10 on, my, on IMBD and winning countless awards. Overall, Mad Max Fury Road is considered to be not only the best Mad Max film, but also one of the greatest action films of all time. But why is that? What made Mad Max Fury Road so great and engaging to watch? Taking an Australian audience into mind, how did the film reach out and engage an Australian audience, especially since Australian films made by Australians don't normally get a lot of attention in Australia like they do overseas? For example, the Australian film The Butter Book was very popular overseas, but got no recognition in Australia. What did Fury Road do that helped engage and communicate its meaning to Australian audiences? And what relevant issues occurred in Australia during the film's production period that may have influenced elements of the film? What conventions contributed to the film's appeal and engagement? And most importantly, what does this media product mean to someone like me in today's society? Before we get into what made Mad Max Fury Road so great, here is a quick recap on what the film is about. Haunted by his turbulent past, Max Rokantansky believes the best way to survive is to wander alone. Nevertheless, he becomes swept up with a group fleeing across the wasteland in a war rig driven by an elite Imperator Furiosa. They are escaping a citadel, tyrannised by the Morton Joe from whom something irreplaceable has been taken. Enraged, the warlord marshals all his gangs and pursues the rebels ruthlessly in the high-octane road war that follows. Although the story to Mad Max Free Road is nothing special, it is how George Miller executes this story is what makes it special and is able to successfully engage not only international audiences, but also an Australian audience. This is accomplished through the use of three media codes. They are editing, lighting, and sound. Editing is important for an action sequence to be great. It's not just about having great stunts or pyrotechnics. The filmmaker needs to find a way to take something utterly chaotic and guide the audience through that chaos. For example, during the opening scene of the film, as Max runs through the tunnels of the Citadel in an attempt to escape from the War Boys, in order to create an action sequence that is both fast-paced and energetic, without feeling like a chaotic mess, Miller's filming team accomplished this by maintaining the centre of the frame as the focal point of every shot during the film by utilising eye trace and crosshair framing techniques. To increase the intensity of the scene, it is mostly filmed slash edited from an over-the-shoulder shot, which almost makes the scene feel like a video game as we follow Max as he attempts to escape. We feel like we are right behind him. How? We feel like we are right with him, which puts us in the forefront of the action. Therefore, when the war boys jump at Max or when Max falls, or when he experiences a flashback, we not only witness what Max is going through, we feel it too. The end result of editing the scene like this is a scene that is fast paced but still easily digestible for audiences.
Lighting serves a key purpose to each scene as it is used to give each scene a different feel. For example, during the chase scene during the day, the hard lighting used is to light up the surrounding areas. That way, the audience can clearly see what is happening as well as establish a unique feel for the film. However, during the chase scene at night, in the mudlands, dark lighting is used to create suspense through the use of dark shadows and lack of lighting. On top of this, the scene uses a thick mist to limit both the characters and viewers' perspective of the surrounding area, forcing the characters to result to sound and bright lights in the distance to make decisions on what they should do next, or how close the enemies are to their position, which builds upon the already established suspense of the scene. Another example is the use of different lighting between Max and Furiosa throughout the film to establish how the characters currently feel about each other. When Max first meets Furiosa and the runaway wives, harsh lighting is used to establish the contrast between the characters, but as the film progresses, the lighting becomes warm and friendly between the characters, which establishes how the characters currently feel about each other. The film makes use of both diegetic and non-diegetic sounds to heighten the action. But what are diegetic and non-diegetic sounds? Diegetic sounds refer to any sounds that emanate from the story world of the film. This includes sounds like the war rig's horn, explosion sounds, or the Doof Warrior's guitar playing. They allow characters as well as viewers to hear what is happening around them in their current situation. On the other hand, non-diegetic sounds refers to any sound that does not originate from within the film's world. These sounds are sounds that the film's characters cannot hear. This notably includes the film's soundtrack. Soundtracks are used to set a mood or tone of the scene. For example, during any of the film's chase scenes, a loud, energetic soundtrack is used to engage the audience's investment in what is currently going on. Or when something bad is about to happen, like Nux's sacrifice, the music is less loud and energetic and more tamed and soothing as it prepares audiences to anticipate what is about to happen next. Although Mad Max Fury Road is an international film intended for international audiences, there are a number of inherently Australian elements woven into its fabric. These Australian elements are present through character dialogue, character traits and appearances, but the most important Australian element is the film's key theme of drought. Australia has weathered some of the most devastating droughts on the planet, which has brought the country further complications from dust storms to wildfires. An example of drought in Australia is from 1996 and through 1997. There were low rainfall conditions and worsened through particularly dry years in 2001 and 2002. By 2003, this drought was recognised as the worst drought on record. This drought is known as the Millennium Drought, which lasted from 2001 to 2009 and affected most of South Australia. The Millennium Drought threatened Adelaide's water supply Therefore, pipelines had to be built to deliver drinking water to the Lower Lakes communities and sustain valuable horticulture industries. Supplies to nearly 4,000 South Australian irrigators that got their water from River Murray were severely restricted, which put pressure on agricultural and horticulture industries and regional communities. 33 wetlands were temporarily disconnected to save water, risking long-term damage to the ecosystem. Overall, the Millennium Drought devastated communities, industries and the environment, and it's considered to be the worst drought rec recorded since European settlement. However, despite the devastation that droughts can cause, they do, however, influence themes in movies, especially in Mad Max Fury Road, because the main theme of the movie is drought. Let me explain, but first, let's talk about director George Miller and his experiences with droughts. Growing up as a kid in Australia, George Miller was impacted by the scarcity of water in his environment. When Miller spoke to Hollywood Reporter, he recalled how he remembered adults talking about the imminent water wars and stayed that, growing up in an isolated rural town, 
I was very aware of the cycle of droughts and floods, so it was a natural thing to put it in this story. This is evident in the film itself, because Mad Max Fury Road takes place in a parched near-future Australia, where the control and manipulation of water is the greatest power in the world. Throughout the film, drought is present through ragged costuming, panning shots of endless desert, entirely void of any type of greenery, which is evident of the, with the opening shot of Max standing in front of an end, endless desert wasteland. Throughout Mad Max Free Road, the theme of drought impacts the world of Mad Max through its environment. The environment has been impacted by being completely void of any trees, rivers, or other type of greenery, or sense of nature, because this is typically a result of drought, as seasonal rivers and water holes usually dry up during a drought due to the lack of any rainfall, which can lead to the demise of other living organisms that rely on water for survival, like sheep, pigs, koalas, crocodiles, etc. This is evident throughout the film, as the only animals to appear are animals that don't need a lot of water to survive, like lizards and insects. The lack of any rainfall or water source has impacted vegetation, as without water, plants have died, which further has impacted animal populations, as well as depriving the world of any greenery. The lack of any rainfall has caused crops and livestock to die, which has led to famine, forcing humans in the Mad Max world to eat whatever they can find, like lizards or bugs, and a high demand for food resources. Furthermore, when the characters depart on their journey to the green place, they are forced to battle the dry and choked landscape ahead of them, speeding through electrical sandstorms and struggling through mud flats and salted earth. Throughout the journey, the characters are constantly choking on dust, at dirty and dehydrated from a lack of water, and with a survival instinct driving them toward a potentially non-existent green place, the green place acts as a kind of paradise, a remnant of a past earth filled with greenery and many mothers. This green place is our earth today. We live in the paradise. It is this that allows the film to engage a large Australian audience, as many Australians suffer the effects and or aftermath of droughts, which makes this film very engaging for them, as they are able to relate to the current issues being presented to them on screen, and the issues the characters must face in order to reach this green place. Although the film has a fantastic theme of drought, as well as perfectly crafted action scenes, all that wouldn't matter, because to have a great action film, you need to have good characters who the audience will care about and engage with, and that is another thing that Mad Max Fury Road accomplishes. The titular character is back on the big screen after 30 years of absence, yet the film is able to engage older audiences as well as younger audiences through Max's interesting character arc. Let me explain. You see, at the start of the film, Max is a loner. He is haunted by his past. He is constantly running. He does not trust anyone and won't tell, even tell anyone his name. This is evident in the scene when Furiosa asks Max for his name, and this happens. Hey, what's your name? What do I call you? Does it matter? Fine. When I yell fool, you drive out of here as fast as you can. However, as the film progresses and Max spends more time with Furiosa and the wives, he begins to recognize the goodwill in Furiosa and the innocence of the wives, which exposes him to humanity again after being alone for so long and he slowly begins to trust people again. The first major turning point for him is when he decides to stop running and advises the others to go back and retake the citadel. By doing this, it highlights how Max is willing to help the group 
by preserving the hope that Furiosha created for them with the idea of the green place. The second major turning point is at the end of the film when this happens. My name is Max. This highlights how Max has regained his humanity through this journey. He still has some demons in his past, but now he has regained the willingness and ability to trust others. Although Max does not have much dialogue in the film, the very little dialogue he does speak is able to embody Max's character. For example, the line, You know hope, hope is a mistake, if you don't fix what is broken, you'll go insane, is one of the most important lines of the movie, as it embodies Max's character and the theme of redemption, and working to improve what you have instead of constantly running away from it in search of some empty hope of things getting better. By creating an interesting character arc of redemption, George Miller is able to create an interesting protagonist that audiences will engage with as they follow him on his tough journey. Although Miller is able to create an engaging protagonist for audiences to follow and root for, arguably the most important character in the film is Immortan Joe. Immortan Joe is the ruler of the Citadel, which is a cluster of three rock towers that sit above an aquifer of relatively fresh water. By channeling the water through the rock, the people of the Citadel have been able to irrigate a small area of the wasteland. The reason why Immortan Joe is the most important character in the film is because he was able to manipulate the harsh conditions the drought brought by mining water which is held by currency, as he has vertical crops grown, which allowed him to offer refuge to people in the citadel in exchange for their loyalty and ordolition. This allowed him to expand his power and make himself so powerful that no one would dare to question his actions or power. For example, when his wives escaped with Furiosa, Immortan Joe goes to extreme lengths to get them back, which in turn causes him to use up a lot of important resources, like water, oil, etc, and lose a lot of manpower. Yet, none of his followers question his actions, which illustrates not only their loyalty to him, but also how powerful he truly is. By creating an interesting, menacing villain, Miller is able to engage the audience on what is going to happen as they are pursued by him. Immortan Joe is arguably the most important character in the entire film because it is his actions slash motivations that influence the way his wives and Furiosa act, which ultimately leads to them attempting to run away from him. It is also his war boys who find and capture Max and bring him along for the chase, which leads to Max finding Furiosa and agreeing to assist her on her journey. Even when a Morton Joe is not present on screen, his presence is still felt, as it is the reason why the events in the film are taking place. Overall, when Mad Max Fury Road came out, it was a huge success critically, with many reviews praising the film for Miller's direction, screenplay, action sequences, music score, cinematography, editing, costume design visuals and the performance of the cast, particularly from Hardy and Theron. The film garnered a number of award nominations in a variety of categories, including 10 Academy Award nominations at the 88th Academy Awards and won most of the awards of the ceremony, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Costume Design, 15 nominations at the 5th AACTA Awards and won 10 including Best Film and Best Director. The American Film Institution included the film in their list of the top 10 films of the year. On Metacritic, which sampled 51 reviews and calculated a weight average of 90 out of 100, Fury Road received universal acclaim. Audiences polled by CinemaScore gave an average grade of B-plus on an A-plus to F scale. IGN reviewer Scott Kolura gave the film 9.2 out of 10, describing 
the over-the-top stunts and eccentric characters and designs are all hugely important to Fury Road, as are the, uh, the troubled figures like Max himself and Furiosa. But it's the overriding sense of the film's uniqueness, it's striving to be something more than just another action film, that is the most impressive. In May of 2015, the Black and Chrome edition was released, which has only added to the hype of the film, with another Mad Max sequel in development. With all the hype surrounding the film, the question is raised whether I can engage with a film from an older franchise. While personally, I thought the movie was great, and I feel I can still engage with this film despite it being part of an older franchise, because as I watched the film, I felt that I knew the characters already, as each character possessed interesting individual traits that made them likeable and gave me an idea of where each character was coming from, which allowed the film to rely on visual storytelling. This was one of the strengths of the film for me, because the film could stand on its own without newer audiences like me needing to have seen the previous films. I felt that the story had a nice flow to it, with every scene serving slash contributing a purpose to the greater story, and the journey the characters faced, which helped making unexpected twists work in the film, instead of feeling like cheap gags, and its fast-paced editing made the action scenes very entertaining to watch, and contributed to the movie's fast pace. Overall, I was able to engage with this older product, and I feel many new audiences will too, because this film not only serves as a revisiting of the Mad Max series, but also a film that can stand on its own, allowing anybody to be able to sit down and engage with the film without having any prior knowledge to, of the series.